How are you doing? <laughs> okay, that sounds better. Coding culture. Um, so what we do as software developers is we, we, we talk about our code, how to make the code better, um, how to improve, which technology we should use, should we use, um, how can we split up our, our monolith into microservices, or should we use a SQL or a NoSQL database, all these decisions, how can we make the product better? We're doing day in, day out. This is our job, this is what we do. And we're talking about that. But sometimes we actually tend to forget to talk about how we do stuff together as a team, how we work together in an organization, how we, how we actually get our stuff out there. So we tend to forget to talk about our culture, our behavior as software developers. Um, and this is what this talk is about. Um, now I just want to give you a, a warning here. Um, you might think, Hey, all this stuff, Sven, that you say today, that's profane. We all know this. Yeah, we should do it like this. That might be true, yes. Um, you heard it before, maybe. Uh, but sometimes it's good to be reminded what's really important. What is really important for us to, to build a great culture? This is one thing. And then I would talk about how you as a team actually be open and transparent on one hand. But on the other hand, you should respect each other. And that goes hand in hand. These two things go hand in hand. It has both to do with our culture. So let's get started. Um, and I start the talk with talk, talking to you, telling you what is culture in general? What is an organizational culture? Um, so what I did actually, like every speaker, looks up in Wikipedia. What does Wikipedia say? And Wikipedia says culture is about our behaviors, our language, our assumptions, our, what, we, what we do. So you read this long article on Wikipedia about organizational culture, and at the end you think, what is culture now? I have still no clue. It's like this fluffy thing. What is that? A, a, a hamster, a, a guinea pig, a rabbit? I don't know. It's, and it's, you can't really touch it. It's, it's very fluffy. You cannot really say this is the culture. Okay, sorry, first attempt to tell you what to explain to you what culture is. I failed totally, so sorry for that. So let's talk a little bit about, um, so, so let's give me, give me a, a second try here. Um, a culture actually that makes the developers happy. What makes us happy as, as developers? Beer on tap, yay. <laughs> We like the, those things. In the office directly, go just have a beer after work together, that's great. What else? Ping pong and free food, yeah. <laughs> just grab a Coke at the fridge or, or, or whatever you want, uh, some candy from the candy bar. Great, awesome. So you see this is our uh, Charlie's Bar in Sydney. Uh, this is our uh, kitchen in San Francisco. Uh, what else? Nerf guns, you, <laughs> shooting around with Nerf guns, all great. This is a great culture, isn't it? We all want to work for, for a company that does like, things like that. Really? Well, this is not culture. It has nothing to do with culture, actually. Um, you can work in an environment like this, cool startup environment, Silicon Valley, wow, blown away, but the culture could still suck. It could still suck. So, sorry, second attempt to explain to you what culture is. I failed again. Okay, give me, give, me, give me a third try here. So, um, and I, I take it now from the other side. I, I uh, have a bad culture example. Um, so, a few years ago, before I worked for Atlassian, I was working for, for a company. Um, I, was, I was leading the web development team and there was an embedded development team. And this, these software had to talk together. So, um, actually one day I found a bug in the, in the embedded software. So, I raised an issue and it came back with won't fix. I said, what the fuck, won't fix? I, I, that's an obvious bug. You have to fix that bug. Uh, so I talked to my manager, talked to their manager, talked to the team. We had a meeting, um, talked about it. They actually admitted, okay, it's, it's not really a bug. It's more a feature request that you have, okay, whatever. <laughs> um, so two months later, they fixed it, great. Well, that's not good. I mean, I, if, if I w would have be able to change the code and the embedded software, I could do it. I could point to the line of code where, 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 where the change has to be made. So, um, I'm talking about this bad culture example, I could have pointed to the code. So, 
Why is that happening, actually? Why are actually companies doing stuff like this? Why, why, why are they? Why? why? Huh. I think, I think we can go down to that it's his fault. We can blame him here. Does anyone know who that is? It's Frederick Winslow Taylor, famous for his Taylorism, beginning of last uh, century. He actually said, we need efficient workers. We need efficient workers. So what we do is we build these assembly lines and let just the workers put stuff together. Don't think, actually Henry Ford once said, I don't want my workers to think. They should just come to work, put the stuff together, don't think in between, um, that stops the assembly line, and then go home. That's what they're supposed to do. But they, had to, they, they needed to have some people that actually, um, that actually had to start, start thinking about putting together the assembly line. So what they did is actually they invented the manager that takes care of the assembly line and puts everything together, yeah. And I think we, we, we still have that in, in, in most organizations that it, it's getting a little bit away, but still uh, we, we still have that, that the managers are thinking for us. So, but actually times have changed. Uh, we are not, we're not working in, a, in factories anymore. Our work has changed. We are knowledge workers. We work with our brains. Um, so, also, people actually have changed. They want to actually see more. They just don't want to go to work, put stuff together, and go home again. They want to get their ideas out there and see that customers really use those ideas. Companies, well, I can see a change there, but it's a slow, slower change um, than actually our industry changes. Well, so sum this up, actually, in the past, we were a little bit working like, like Fred Flintstone, you know. Um, uh, 5 p.m., the, the horn blows, yabba dabba doo, down the dinosaur, home to Wilma. Um, but now we are a little bit more like, like, uh, like, like the Incredibles. There's something really important we have to get fixed and save the world. We have to jump on it and do it, and maybe we, we, we work a little bit longer, yes, but uh, maybe we push everything aside just to fix that. Yes, and then we take maybe the next day off or something. Um, we're a little bit more like this right now. Um, I'm happy to work in a company that's called Alassian that has a great culture. Um, I work as a vandalist there. Um, we're doing tools like Jira, Confluence, HipChat, Bitbucket. Um, you might have heard of us. Uh, and we are, we are, I mean, when I started a few years ago, um, actually five, five and a half years ago, uh, we were a bunch of cool people um, hanging around. So this was our Halloween party. We don't dress up like this uh, all the time. But also here, Five years ago, cool, 300 people. Now we are almost 2,000 people. Um, culture changes. And we are not, we're not that funny anymore. Now we are more looking, looking actually like this here. Well, we come to, with suits. We like suits to work. Um, no, that's of course not. Um, that's actually, instead of having a casual Friday, we're doing formal Fridays. Uh, it's two or three times a year. We just dress up and have fun, so fun. A culture of fun is also very important to have some fun on, at, at work. Um, so let, let's get started. Uh, culture of innovation. Innovation is very important, really. It's, it's actually the thing that drives our industry forward. And it goes like this. Innovate or die. I mean, how long can, you, can, can your product live without any innovation? You will have a competitor taking you over in, in one, two, three, four years. Depending on the industry you're working on, it could be a little bit slower, but really. And, and companies understand that. They want innovation. So what they do is they say to their workers, go and innovate. But do also what, what you're supposed to do. But in between, you can do some innovation. What? I mean, well, that never happens, actually. If some, some companies put innovation as their, as their company value, and then they, they're not doing anything for it, for, for the innovation, to get that started. Um, so other companies are doing this here. They give you. 500 bucks for an innovative idea. And then you can submit that. Uh, an innovation committee reads through all the innovation ideas and say, oh, this is very innovational. This is not so innovational. But well, also here, it doesn't really motivate. I mean, I've been working for such companies, uh, and it, 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 it isn't, it's, it's not very, very uh, motivated to just say, OK, 500 bucks, and then I have to, I, have to, I mean, I need, I need actually some time to write everything down and stuff like that. So that really doesn't motivate me to, to bring innovation to, to the, our products. But it's actually very easy. It's totally easy how you can bring innovation. Just give, give people time. 
give people time to try out their innovative <laughs> ideas. People have those ideas. They come to work, they have those ideas. You should just give them time to try them out. If that's really something that sticks, or is that something that is not, it, it sounded good, but doesn't really work. Um, so what we do actually, we're doing ship it days. And this is a quarterly hackathon. So every quarter, we are taking one and a half days off for a 24 hour hackathon. Um, we're doing some brainstorming uh, before the ship a day where we just gather ideas and build teams around the ideas. Then on a Thursday, 3 p.m., we're starting with the, with the, with the ship a day and start hacking, start doing stuff. Um, and then some people go home, some people sleep under the desk, whatever. Um, and, come, and other people come back in the morning or uh, early to start working on their innovative idea. And at the end, we show, and this is the magic moment actually for, for everyone, we show our innovative idea to the whole company. And you get applause for your great idea and you see, that's great, that's so good. Um, and then we vote for the winner. Um, for example, what we did is actually uh, this year, this is our product HipChat and somebody built a universal translator into HipChat so you could log in and use it into your language and if you type something in your language, it's translated into the other languages. We used just, just a simple uh, Google Translate, the API for that um, and, and it worked great, everyone loved it, but sad that is this will never make it, make it in the, in the pro, into the product. Uh, the, the translation is not very good that comes out of it, so it's not very helpful. But it was a try to, to try it out. Um, so what you get out of the ship it day is actually a working prototype. So something that is, that is not ready, it's just a showcase. Uh, sometimes half of the presentation is just mocked. Uh, it's not really ready, uh, the code is not ready, it's just presentation. But you get a prototype, get an idea what this, what, 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 how, how it will look like. Um, but more importantly actually, you get happy developers. That's actually the reason why I became a developer, because I want to create stuff, get my ideas out there and see that uh, that's going to be used. Um, and this is actually innovation for the masses. So a ship a day is not just the, the research uh, the department that is allowed to, to do some, some innovative ideas, try it out. It's really for everyone. And when I say everyone, I mean everyone. Even, even our, our, our legal and finance people, they also do ship it, ship it projects and marketing. So, um, and it's, it's, it's really important that you get everyone on it because ideas can happen to you all the time. Actually, I got my best under, ideas under the shower during workout. Um, it's not happening actually at work. Um, because innovation happen. What you should do is just to give, give them, give, give, it, give it the possibility to, to let these innovative ideas that you have and that, that everyone has in your company, let, let them grow. Um, all right, let's jump over to a culture of happiness. Uh, we all want to be happy at work. So how do organizations help us to be happier at work? Yeah, they're doing these uh, yearly events where they make a summer party or something and get the whole company together and you see other people from other departments have fun with them. We're doing family and friends day or we're doing some team building uh, stuff where we take out the team and do some river rafting or mountain climbing, also great. Or what we also do is uh, end of fiscal year party, last year was games of code, um, where we just put different people from different uh, organization, different, different organization in, inside Atlassian together and let them fulfill some tasks. Um, so, Fun with coworkers, great. What you do is you build relationships outside of your teams because you get to know other people uh, outside of your teams. Um, and then also, especially with these team building events, you learn about the strengths and weaknesses of your, of your teammates, who is really fast decision maker and reacts very fast and who's more the thoughtful thinker who thinks things through um, and, and, and that you can apply also to your daily work. That's great, you do it once, maybe twice a year. But what are you doing on a weekly basis? Uh, we are all agile, so we're doing sprints. Um, and at the end of the sprint, what are we supposed to do? Retrospective. So we're looking back and saying, okay, this worked, this didn't work. Um, so let's improve uh, for the next sprint. And then you go on to the next sprint. And then you improve again and go on to the next sprint. We're getting better always. I hate that. It's called sprinting. It's really like we're just running. We're just looking forward and running. But sometimes it's also good to look back and say, wow, look what we achieved. Actually, my favorite movie from the 80s is Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and Ferris says a very important sentence here. He says, life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. And that's so true, and we should do that much more often as software developers. We should stop 
and celebrate our wins. We just released a, a new feature. Awesome, great. Let's, let's uh, organize a release party. Let's come together, invite all the stakeholders, organize a release party and have fun together. Or, or do a team offsite, go out before you start with your, with your next project. Or if you don't get support from your management, uh, what I did in another company is I just, I just brought some cake and bring all the stakeholders together uh, and, and then we just talked about what, how awesome this feature is and how it improves our customers so much, so that's great. That said, for software developers, that's relatively easy. We are pretty privileged because we really create stuff. We can really say, ah, oh, look what we've done here, that's great. Not all teams at Elastin can do that. For example, the service team, the support team, what can they say? Yeah, we answered 500 support cases, great. Um, they, it's really like this. So they, they actually sat down and wrote down their, their values, their service team values, um, and said, this is really important for us. We should stick with this, make the customer awesome, take responsibility, have fun. This is all great. They printed it on the poster and put it in the office. But the, the thing is, if you go every day into the office as a support guy, uh, say, answer support case, look at that, oh, make the customer awesome, yes. It gets blurry. It gets blurry on a day-to-day -day basis. You don't see that anymore. But they thought it's so important for, for, for our support persons, people um, that we have those values. And we should celebrate also those values. So what they do is actually every two weeks they come together as a team and then celebrate their, their, their cultural rock stars. So they look at what, what we did the last two weeks and say, oh, you did a great job. Um, so they write a poem or rap song or they just take a guitar and start singing. Can we get sound? Um, sound. <laughs> it's been working before. Yeah. Should I just? how Rick and Jeff felt afterwards. They felt great, really. That, this really makes us happy if, if we get really appreciated for what we do. Um, but it also helps us to focus what's really important for us. These are not the 500 support cases. These are the things that, that, that is really important for us, that we, we, we stick together as a team. So how happy are you? You're probably happy you're sitting here, Cope Motion, enjoying keynotes and, and other great talks. Um, that's awesome. But, but what about your team? Do you know how happy your team is that is sitting somewhere else um, right now? Probably not. I don't know. Maybe you know, maybe you don't. So how do organizations find out how happy their teams are? Or, 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 or team leads, how they find out how happy their teams are? Well, they're doing this here. A survey. Yeah, we ask our teams, how happy are you? Good, happy, not so happy, in between, somewhere, hmm, maybe. Well, sad that is, this sucks, and it's, it's also slow feedback. Maybe you do it once a year. Maybe if you're good, you're doing it twice a year. Um, it's very, very, sh very, very long feedback loop. Um, so what we did actually in the Ship It Day, we, we made a project called the Mood app. It's an iPad app, and it looks like this. And it's, it's every, every exit at Alaskan, you, when you leave the office, you say, how do you feel today? Um, and then we can measure, actually, the, the, uh, the happiness um, of, of our employees. Um, but that might, might be a little bit, and then we can see decrease and increase and react on that. But also getting the same questions each day may be a little bit boring, so we adapt the questions and ask, for example, how do, how do you see your manager? Does he know what you like and what you don't like? Um, <laughs> and ask that. Or after our end of fiscal year party, we also ask uh, people, how happy are you today? Um, and most people are happy but not feeling very well. Um, so this really tells us a little bit about uh, just, just, on a, on an, uh, just, just on the surface, 
uh, how, how our employees feel. Of course, you have to go more deeply uh, into it later, but um, we're not the only company that doing it on a regular basis. Also, Spotify does that. And Spotify asks their employees, how happy are you? And 91% said, happy. Boom, great, awesome, 91%, see you later. No, what is the rest 9%? What, what's, wh why are they unhappy? We have to find out. So they actually talked to the unhappy people um, and then they found out some easy to fix stuff. So they run the survey again and said 94% happy. Okay, you cannot make everyone happy, um, that's pretty impossible, um, but at least they know the, what the rest, what bothers the rest 6% um, to make them uh, happier. All right. So, a culture of balance your passion. Uh, it's very, 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 very important. Um, and what, what I mean by that, I will explain right now. So, why do we code? Because I already said that, for me, I can say creating stuff really is something that makes me happy. Um, so, what are the ingredients for, for these great software that I want to create? So, let's ask the Swedish chef here. What, are, what, what do we need uh, to create great software? Well, some good tooling always helps, uh, so having good tooling in place, cool. Um, support from the management that I say, I have to push the deadline two weeks out, sorry management, and the management says, okay, we understand you, Sven, get support from us, very important. Of course, we're talking about culture here, so culture of, of respect and trust within the team, that's pretty important. And of course, also that I get passionate people, talented people in my team. So, give that to me, and I create you great software. Well, really? Why do we code? Um, because creating stuff makes us happy? Well, actually, we create software for our customers to make them happy. That makes me happy if they are happy. And that's what we tend to forget in our, our daily discussion. We tend to forget the customers, but the customer is important. And also at Atlassian, we tend to forget that. But we have great customers like, like, like Emma here. Um, Emma is a customer of ours, she just started with Confluence, so it's a new, new user of Confluence. And if we create a feature, we think about how will Emma use that feature? How will she discover that feature? How should we, will she use it? But Emma is not our only customer, we also have William. And William is a 10 years, very experienced Confluence administrator and user. So <clears throat> maybe we make things easier for Emma on one hand, but we make it harder for William to use our product. So we also have to balance that. We also have to see what, how, how will William use that. Um, now, sad that is these customer, of course, don't exist. Um, they are fake. We made them up. They represent customers of ours and because we use personas. So personas are pretty important stuff for us. Uh, for example, Emma is a persona. We write everything down about Emma, what we know. So uh, what she does is how she thinks. Um, and we stick those on walls so everyone can see that. Of course, you can go deeper into MRS to see what she likes, what she don't likes in a, in, a, in a spare time and stuff like that, what software and languages she uses. And as I said, we stick those on walls and you can't escape. They are everywhere. You get reminded every, every day of these personas and you can't really escape from these personas. They are literally everywhere at Atlassian, <laughs> even on the bathrooms. Um, and people come, come up with new personas all the time, like run on the virus, uh, hanging around bathrooms, very funny. Um, so, <laughs> and, um, so also, but also here, if you look at these personas each day, well, it gets, it gets sometimes blurry. You can see that, yeah, Emma is great, well, whatever. Um, so we actually created these persona cards. So if, if we go into this feature discovery phase, we take those cards with us, um, and there are questions on it that we can ask during that phase. So we have these persona cards, and we take them with us to this, to this, uh, to this uh, feature discussions, and then we argue with these personas. We can really take them into our hands and say, well, look at William. William will use it this way. And then we draw on the whole customer journey. We draw, draw it on, and people actually, and that's on, 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 on big, big boards within the, within the office, so people can actually go there and change it and add their comments on it. Um, so, um, this is how we visualize it for everyone. Um, so, said that is be passionate about, about your software. Be passionate what you do. Because actually we spend eight hours a day at work. So we better be passionate about our customers and what we do for them. Um, and if you are passionate, if you're really, really into it and you think about the customer always and how can I make it better for the customer, um, your product looks like this. Wow, nice and shiny. Looks fabulous and everyone says wow you have such a great product look at this shiny great and then somebody says there's this small little thing 
uh, can, you, can you please change that? And say, yeah, sure, I open the IDE, oh, look at my code, and my code looks like this. <laughs> something wrong here. You have thought about your customer very, very thoroughly, but you forgot something else. We are engineers, and we have values too. So think about your engineering values. So I'm a Java programmer, and um, I will just introduce some engineering values that we have, three, three of these values, we have a little bit more. Um, so I'm a Java developer, and I have seen this code always somewhere in, in every code base I've been looking at. A Boolean that returns a Boolean, it's nonsense. Okay, we have a value, don't write crappy code. Don't do that, don't write crappy code. And sometimes people come to you and tell you, well, I know you can do that in just one week. Uh, say, it takes actually a month. Well, you can do that, you just take the shortcuts and then it's done, I know, I know you can do that. Say no. Say no if you know that this will harm the code later on and you will not have time to clean that up. Say no. Have engineering values um, like don't write crappy code. Okay, some other code here. Um, I don't know if you can read that. It's a, it's a for loop. Uh, it goes over uh, array and then looks at zip field entries. Well, believe me, that code is okay. It's, it's okay. You could make it better, but it's okay. But always look for better solutions. So if you use Java 8, Use the streams, the new stream API. Yeah, that's it's so much better. You can better read that code. Um, it looks so much better. So always look for better solutions. That's another engineering value that you have. Um, are people from Brazil here? One, two. Can you please close your eyes and ears right now? Because I have this slide here. Um, <laughs> that actually happened. I'm from Germany. Um, so, but. Well, what I wanted to say is, you can see the scoreboard here, and not all the scorers, scorer, uh, scorers fit, fit on the scoreboard. Well, a scorebar would be a solution, but it would, would, would be uh, good for television, so always look for better solutions. Try and find better ways. That's another engineering value that we have. Um, said that is, you probably have no, no persons who always try to find the best way they can do. The newest technology. And they love to discuss things, and they love to, to have endless discussions about that. I call them the prima donnas. They really think, oh, yeah, we should use, use this newest technology. Say, so, yeah, let's get stuff done. Let's get stuff done here. Um, um, so, so the thing is, you have these, these conversations maybe here. The thing is, turn your passion into products. You should tell them. Great, you're passionate, but turn that into the product. That's another engineering value that, you, that we have. Um, and also important, we've wrote them down, put them on posters, and, and put them up in, the, in our room so everyone can read them and can see them, actually. Um, so you can refer to them. If somebody comes to your office and says, you can do that in one day, I know. No, we don't write crappy code. That's our engineering value. So that's what I mean with balance your passion. So code is very important, clean code, but also think about the customer and make the customer happy. And we always have to balance that. Okay, let's move on with the culture of being one team. Um, let's play some numbers here. Twelve. Twelve seems to be the natural team size. Back in the Stone Age, we were around twelve people hunting the mammoth. Um, 150. 150 is Dunbar's number. And 150 uh, tells us, it's, it's Dunbar's number is around 150. It could be 120, it could be 180. But it tells us a little bit how many stable relationships we can maintain. So if companies grow above these number, this 150 number, um, what, what always, what, what uh, a lot of times happens is we get into the silos. We are the cool programmers, and then you have the, the legal people on the other side, and they don't understand shit. Um, so this is really a problem, the silo problem, but we need to bring people together. So it's, it's actually going like this. If you're a developer and you want to use an open source library and you go to the legal people and say, we need to use that in our software, the legal people say, nope, not this license, not allowed. We don't, that's, that's no, no way we can use that in our software. You can use that in your software. And the developer, but you don't understand. It saves us so much time to use that. Come on, find a way. Well, it's good to bring those people together and let them really, really talk. So if you think about a legal person looks like this, yeah. We hate those people. They don't understand stand us as developers. But if a legal person looked like this, uh, you think, ah, yeah, maybe I just, just go over to his desk and ask, 
kindly, what, what, what's the reason why? And so it's important to bring people together. Um, so what we do is we write introductory blog posts. So everyone that starts at Elastian in the first week has to write an introductory blog post. And it's about personal stuff. So share some personal stuff so you get to know this person better. You build really relationships. And then you can actually start conversations, ask, hey, I saw you playing soccer, so we, we, are, we have a soccer team here uh, meeting every Thursday at 4 p.m. Come join us. Um, and that makes the company so transparent. Transparency is important. Um, we share everything at Elastian. We share our wins, uh, sorry, our wins, our fails, our our decisions, and our questions that we have. So for example, our wins. Um, here, our design team has won a design award. Great. They shared it with the whole company, so everyone knows it. Um, or our fails. We're doing 20% time, and Nick was writing a blog post here about why is it broken. And, and at the same time, but how can we fix that and start a discussion? How can we do stuff better as a team? Um, or questions that we have. Our, our founder had the questions, how do you want to see and last in the year 2016, two years ago, he asked that question. And he actually, we got a lot of answers. You see 182 answers from Atlassians that are very passionate. And one of the highest voters' answers was uh, to open source our culture somehow um, to make that broader that everyone can actually apply stuff from our culture. Or if you're doing, if you're sitting in these, these big, big uh, company come together, the CEO rocks up the stage like here, um, our, our CEO rocks up the stage and explains how the company performing, what are we doing in the future, and then at the end, has anyone questions? And then I'm, I'm, I'm more of the shy guys, it's always the same guys that ask questions, I'm more of the, the, the introvert people that don't ask questions, um, and I'm, I'm, um, maybe my question is too provocative and I got fired the next day, or uh, um, my, my, my question is too profane, I don't know, so I better not ask questions, but what, you, what we do is, before the all hands, you can ask questions actually through a tool, and then we upvote the questions, and no matter what, the top 15 questions has to be answered by our CEO. No matter what, what these questions are, they have to be answered. Um, so, and that makes actually our, our, our organization much more transparent, bringing people together. Um, let them know what you're working on. Let them know what, 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 what you achieved. All this stuff brings people together and helps also to spread the culture. I'm a remote worker and I read these articles each day and it helps you to spread the culture over the whole organizations. Okay, now a culture that scales. We need to, we need to be as built. So we are in a very scalable business or a very, very business that's, that goes, uh, grows a lot. So we're thinking a lot about scaling and also about scaling our culture. I started with 12, 12 natural team size. I don't believe we should be 12 people in, in, in software development teams. I think six to eight, it's more closer to what I think is a good software development team. Um, and if I say software developers, I say just engineers or developers, because it's not just software developers in the team. I'm a big fan of cross-functional teams to so have QA people, designers, all in, in one team. Um, and then, if, they, if you don't have a design task this week, the designer can go to another team and help them. No, you don't have to just to belong to that one team, you can go to other teams. You have a core team, you're right, but you can also go to other teams. Um, and if you need help, yeah, we can reach out. Uh, we have uh, uh, people with, with some design skills in our team, so um, you can reach out and, and uh, ask for help. Well, said that is about growth. Uh, we, we, are, we are growing and also we have to work with more teams on one product. Um, so we have to split up the teams. So we have more teams working on one product. Actually, I think there are 15 Jira teams right now that works on Jira. And we have to split up the work somehow. In, and, and companies some tend, to, tend to do this here. They split it up like, okay, one team cares about the front end, the performance, and the database. Well. You, get, you run into problems if you do, do things like that. Um, first, coordination problems. The feature normally runs through all those teams, so you have to coordinate those, and this is really problematic. Um, and then, some, some teams miss the customer relation. There's no customer that says, I want an awesome database, but you're sitting in the database team, so where's the customer relation? So also here, we tend not to do that. Um, we have more themed teams. So teams around, for example, for, Com for Confluence, we have a team that cares about easy starting with Confluence. New customers, new users that don't use Confluence each day, um, that, so this team cares about that. Then we have a team that cares about enterprise customers, so huge customers, scalability, 
uh, stuff like that. Um, and then we have a team that cares about developers using Confluence together with Jira or Bitbucket. So you see, we're splitting up teams like, like themes. Um, and then maybe you go into, uh, into this. So these teams are autonomous, and some teams use a tool for that purpose, and other teams don't use a tool at all for that. That's fine. If you're in, in your team region, can, you can use whatever you want. And also some teams have daily meetings, doing daily stand-ups, and some teams just meet whenever it's necessary. It's their team way, how they do things. So these teams are autonomous, and that's very important for us. Now, said that is you probably want to reach out to, to some of these and get some help from other teams. If it's, if it's a team that built the mobile app and you want to just change something in the mobile app, you say, hey, I need, need some support from your team. Can you help us uh, getting a better search in the mobile app or whatever? Um, then you go to this team lead and say, hey, can we get support from your team, please? And this, we all cool people at Alassian. So what we do is, uh, yeah, sure, you can get help, but well, you have to wait two sprints because we have other priorities right now. Um, three words, just do it. Just go in, change the code, try to make, to, to get into mobile development, stuff like that. Um, just do it, and we call that a duocracy. And our duocracy is built on autonomy on one side and trust on the other side. We trust that teams don't, other teams don't mess things up. So, very important. Now, said that is we're growing a lot. Um, and it could go into the wrong direction if you just give teams the autonomy and, and trust them. Um, we also add transparency to the mix. Instead of having processes, we're adding more transparency to the mix. So, for example, in every step of our development phase, uh, we're adding transparency. If we're writing specification, we write them down, like Sharif did here. He wrote down the specification about Confluence page layouts, wrote them down, discussed everything in here, and then shared that with the whole company. And you get response. So it get, gets from Sharif's idea, idea of, of how page layout should work to a whole company idea. And get that all together in the spec uh, specification. Um, also, people that had nothing to do with development comment on that. Um, so we get every, everyone's opinion in there. Um, and then the next thing is, OK, we agreed on what we want to do. We write the code. And then you have to change other people's code. OK, there's no such thing like other people's code. We have a collective code ownership, of course. But how do you make sure that you don't mess up anything in the code base that other people have written? Maybe you have overlooked something when you change the code. Are we doing code reviews? Um, but who's the best person to actually to review your code? Um, so who's, who's the best one to check it? I always invite my friends because they are friendly to me. Say, Sven, great code. Approve it. Great. But these are not the best persons, of course, to to uh, invite for code review. So what we did is we, we wrote a little add-on for, it's free, you can download it for, for Bitbucket, um, and it's auto suggest reviewers. So this thing just suggests reviewers based on if those people have recently changed the file or are the original author of the file. So they must know the code, they are the best persons to review your code. Um, so code, collective code, great. We have written that very transparent with getting input from other parts of the company. Now, what about uh, the, the finished feature? So also here, we're adding transparency. So we're doing these demos of the feature. They are regular, they are open, and you get honest feedback of what you built. So QA is, for example, attending those and say, have you tested this or this? Um, so this is really something where you can go to, you can go to this team's demo and this team's demo to see what they have built. So also here, very transparent. And transparency, instead of actually adding processes and ticking the boxes, it's just open for everyone to join this, um, or to join a code review, or to, to participate in the, in the specification phase. So transparency gives us actually a lightweight control. It's not, we don't have to wait for anyone to, to tick the box. It's a lightweight control, actually. And this way, we're scaling our development um, by, by, by keeping our development speed. Um, well, say that, that we're slowing down. Also, if you add more teams, you're slowing down. But we're trying to, to focus on keeping the, keeping the development speed. All right, um, let's sum this up. So what, what I've been talking about today, I've been talking about being transparent, um, autonomy and trust, balance your passion, be one team, and have the customer in mind. That's great. Good, great, sounds, sounds cool. Uh, you heard some cool stuff, what we're doing. But Still, if you think about what is culture, it's still this fluffy thing. 
You still have no idea. What, what is that? I can't really, still can't touch it. You've now talked for, I don't know, 35, 40 minutes to us. And then I, can, I still don't know what culture is. All right, yeah, because culture is alive. It changes. Yeah, and it's, it's a fluffy thing, sure. But what we want to say is these things are important for us as a company. You might have other, other uh, cultural aspects, but these things are important for us. Um, so we wanted to give it a little bit more stickiness. So people keep that in their heads. So instead of saying, we're a transparent company, we say, open company, no bullshit. Or autonomy and trust, we say, be the change you seek. We say, uh, play as a team, build with heart and balance. And instead of saying, having the customer in mind, we say, don't fuck the customer. So said that is, these are our, our Atlassian values. And you can go to each Atlassian and ask them what are the, the, your, your values, and they will tell them from the top of their head these, these values, because they really mean something for us, and this is also important. Um, so said that is, values gives your culture stability. It, 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 culture changes, sure, but it gives a little bit of stability so you move in the right direction. And it's also important to remind people always what's important for your culture. Um, so we have these printed out, hanging in the ceiling in our kitchen. Uh, so you can really see that if you go to the Amsterdam office, there are posters everywhere about our values. And those values come up in every discussion. If, if we have a feature discovery phase, we say, oh no, we can't do that. We, we fuck the customer with that. We don't fuck the customer. That's our value. That's really something. Or if you say, oh, we won't tell this the, the, in the marketing, we can't tell this, the customer will say, hey, well, open company, no bullshit. We should. We should really should. So, Really important for us, these values. Um, so I guess before I close, I got one more thing. Uh, and actually it has to do with, with Apple. Um, a few years ago, Steve Jobs went up on stage and introduced Ping, social network for music. Great. I, I'm, 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 I'm sure there were some great teams working on Ping and, and making that great. Technology was good, product was good. Where's Ping now? It's gone. They removed it from iTunes. And, but but it, it goes like this. Products come and go. We, 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 we take our passion into the product, but they come and go. But I believe this team this kick, kicks ass again at Apple Music or whatever. It's, it's very important that you not just think about products, but also build a great culture. And this is, I think, much more important than building the products. So products come and go, but the culture is the one that stays at the end. Thank you very much.